Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is a great, great turnout on a blustery night. Thanks for coming to Bear Pond Books for a talk with Garrett Graff. He's here to discuss cybersecurity, the Russian threat, and the new book, Dawn of the Code War, uh, let me just pull it out, which Graff co-authored with the former Assistant Attorney General for National Security, John P. Carlin. But really, Garrett wrote the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned more in the first 10 pages of this book than I have in all the seasons of Homeland. <laughs> it's pretty scary. <laughs> but seriously, this is important work. Um, authors John Carlin and Garrett Graff dive deep into the stories of hacktivism, internet guerrilla warfare, and online terrorism. Um, in Dawn of the Cold War, we learn how criminals, terrorists, and spies make themselves at home on a global network that was never designed with safety and security in mind when we think about the open source internet. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, though. Uh, we see agreements with China to crack down on criminal hacking, and we see Silicon Valley and social media moguls like Twitter cooperating with the Justice Department to shut down 125,000 ISIS and ISIL accounts. And as far as the Russian hacking of our 2016 election, um, I don't know what to say about that. I guess you can say I wasn't surprised, but still disheartened to hear how Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Speaker Paul Ryan torpedoed any bipartisan attempt to get ahead of the hacking when it was brought to their attention prior to the election, as John and, and Garrett point out in this book. Um, if you don't already have this book, you need it. I urge you to pick up a copy tonight, and Garrett will be here to sign copies after the talk. A few housekeeping items. Please mute or turn off your cell phones. Please use the back door if you need to exit before the event is over. We do lock the front door um, to keep the disruptions with the creaky floors down to a minimum. Um, the bathroom is located at the back of the store to the right of the back door. If you'd like to learn about future Bear Pond events, please sign up our newsletter. There is a clipboard going around. Our next event will be Friday, November 2nd. It'll be our last event of our events season this fall. It's called Bullets Into Bells, Poets and Citizens Respond to Gun Violence. It will be poets and citizens from uh, this anthology, which is an amazing anthology. We have Major Jackson, Brian Clements, Matthew Olsman, and a local poet, Karen McCadden, coming to read poems from this book. Um, it'll be at the Unitarian Church on Friday, November 2nd at 7.30, and we are selling tickets for $5 each, and the proceeds will go toward Gun Sense Vermont, who will be at the event to give a talk. So that's exciting. Um, I'd like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event and the Vermont Arts Council for featuring the event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. And I'd like to thank Garrett for being here. Garrett Graff is an award-winning journalist who has spent nearly a decade covering national security. He also serves as executive director of the Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Program a regular writer for Wired, Bloomberg Businessweek, and a former editor of both the Washington, Washington, I can't say this one, <laughs> Washingtonian, <laughs> and Politico magazine. He has an extensive background in journalism and in technology. His oral history of Air Force One during 9-11 is under development for a movie by MGM and his April 2017 Wired cover story about the FBI's hunt for an infamous Russian hacker has also been optioned for television. This is exciting stuff here, folks. Please help me welcome Garrett Graff. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm grateful for Bear Pond for hosting me. They've been a wonderful supporter through my writing career. I think this is uh, my fourth book talk here in four books. So um, I'm happy to be back here again. Um, so this is a book um, that in some ways uh, turned out to be an unintentional sequel to a book that I wrote in 2011 that was 2010, that was a history of the FBI and its counterterrorism mission after 9-11. Um, and at the time, 
I, uh, that book, which is down here, The FBI at War, uh, the, the Threat Matrix, uh, was uh, the story of this relatively anonymous figure who was the FBI director, had started as the FBI director on September 4th, 2001, and on the morning of Tuesday, September the 11th, was sitting in his first briefing on Al-Qaeda and the bombing of the USS Cole, uh, when he was interrupted with word of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Um, that figure, of course, was Bob Mueller, uh, who, when I was writing about him, was in the uh, what, what he thought was the final year of his tenure term as FBI director. Uh, ultimately, he was extended by a special act of Congress uh, that passed uh, the Senate 100 to 0, uh, back in the days uh, both where he was considered a Republican and where the uh, Senate actually passed things 100 to 0 um, and uh, ended up serving a total of 13 years as FBI director, uh, the longest serving FBI director since J. Edgar Hoover himself. And Mueller, uh, sort of, uh, when I was writing about him in uh, 20. Uh, sort of from 2008 to 2010, um, his deputy chief of staff, then chief of staff, uh, was John Carlin. Um, and uh, John and I became friends then, and uh, it was sort of right as the FBI was beginning to move out of this era of counterterrorism being the overwhelming threat. And Mueller and his team and his staff were beginning to look forward to uh, what they saw as really the biggest threat on the horizon at that time, which was Russian organized crime. And the last chapter of the threat matrix uh, is about uh, sort of the FBI beginning to look forward to this threat of Russian organized crime. And so after uh, I finished The Threat Matrix, I spent about a year uh, trying to write a book about Russian organized crime um, and going back and forth to this uh, special FBI task force uh, in Budapest, Hungary, which was where they based their Russian organized crime work. Uh, and there were sort of the, these people working on this issue in the FBI uh, who were uh, again, sort of relatively anonymous figures, uh, people with the names like Lisa Page and Bruce Orr uh, that uh, have become more famous in the time since, uh, but who were sort of looking down the road at the rise of Russian organized crime. Uh, that ended up sort of morphing into uh, uh, the threat that this book ends up covering, which is uh, cybercrime and sort of the rise of cyber threats um, from both the four main cyber adversaries that the U.S. faces, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, as well as sort of this larger set of uh, threat actors, like uh, hacktivists like Anonymous, uh, terror groups like ISIS or ISIL, uh, and then transnational organized crime groups primarily coming from Russia. And uh, John uh, went on from, his, from being uh, chief of staff to Bob Mueller to become uh, eventually the assistant attorney general for national security at the Justice Department uh, in the Obama years, which uh, is the highest uh, it, it, sort of the new role created after 9-11 inside the Justice Department to oversee uh, counterterrorism and counterintelligence uh, I investigations. And so uh, he ended up being the person, uh, along with a colleague of his, uh, Lisa Monaco, who was the uh, his predecessor as Mueller chief of staff, then his predecessor as assistant attorney general, uh, and then she ultimately became President Obama's Homeland Security Advisor. And the two of them sort of put together uh, uh, what was at the time uh, a, a, a really groundbreaking strategy to try to push what was a very shadowy world of cyber threats into the public domain. Um, at the beginning of the Obama administration, 
the U.S. government had never taken public action against Iran, China, North Korea, or Russia for their cyber activities. And that that was all seen as an intelligence problem, not a uh, not sort of a public uh, matter of debate. And so the government was uh, very carefully a, a gathering loads and loads of intelligence on what these different groups were doing and then what they were trying, uh, sort of how they were targeting the U.S., but none of it was being able, none of it was ultimately being moved into uh, action, uh, either publicly or even uh, privately to try to deter these uh, actors and attacks uh, from from doing their uh, doing their work, and it was sort of all this big dark secret inside the uh, in, inside the intelligence community. And one of the things that we uh, that we sort of talk about in this book is to uh, how basically n countries look online like they do in the real world. That uh, that the for nation states, cyber attacks are extensions of the strategic goals that they are trying to accomplish in the real world. And so China is all about uh, trying to grow its economy, trying to uh, crush internal dissent uh, within its borders and to steal uh, intellectual property from abroad that can it can bring home in order to help boost its economy. Uh, North Korea, um, heavily hit by sanctions, uh, heavily uh, depressed uh, economically. Uh, North Korea basically views the internet as a place to rob banks um, and, and to attempt to fund its government uh, through the theft of uh, banks uh, overseas. Um, the, most notably, skipping ahead a little bit in, in my story, they hit um, the Malaysian Central Bank uh, last year, uh, almost got away with a billion dollars, couldn't quite spell correctly, um, <laughs> and so only got away with a hundred million dollars before uh, the bank was like, hey, it kind of seems like you're misspelling a lot of words and asking for the 100 or asking for the billion dollars. Is this actually you asking for the billion dollars? And it was not. Um, uh, Iran uh, and, and Russia, though, have very different goals. Um, and, and this is sort of begins to play into some of what we're, uh, I'll end up talking about with, with Mueller and the Russia investigation, which for countries like Iran and Russia, uh, who are geopolitical adversaries for us. Uh, the internet provides this sort of wonderful asymmetric advantage to them. You know, they cannot take on our military uh, directly. They can't take on our economy directly. But the internet provides uh, this incredible way for them to undertake activities that sort of fall below the radar of what would normally be constituting acts of war uh, that are really annoying uh, and ultimately even uh, ultimately quite damaging. And so when you see sort of the way that Vladimir Putin has used cyber attacks uh, both against places like Ukraine and uh, against uh, things like the Brexit vote and then ultimately against the 2016 election, it, it's as a place to it, exploit the seams in the West, to exploit the seams of Western democracy in such a way where he, he's not necessarily uh, uh, setting up attacks uh, that didn't exist before, but sort of exacerbating the political discord, promoting the political division that already existed. Um, and obviously this is something that we still see going on today. The, on Friday, the Justice Department uh, announced charges against uh, the, the chief accountant of the Internet Research Agency, uh, which is for the Russian troll farm, uh, for activities 
aimed at influencing the 2018 midterm elections in two weeks here that go sort of right up through the summer, that this was sort of activity that did not stop in February when Bob Mueller brought his set of indictments uh, against the Internet Research Agency, but actually has continued on since. And that this, this book uh, ultimately is aimed at sort of walking through the major cases uh, that the Obama administration brought over the course of the last eight years uh, against each of those four actors. Um, and, and it's a story, um, you know, the, the title uh, Dawn of the Cold War is really meant to emphasize that we are still in the very early stages of this, that this is in, in many ways like the, uh, this is where I begin to always trip myself up, very much like the Cold War, the Code War uh, is going to be something that is ultimately a generation-long uh, fight, and that this is, in, in some ways, much more complicated than what we faced in the Cold War, in that the tools and, and the, uh, the weapons of this war are going to be uh, available to a much wider set of actors, um, they're going to be used much more indiscriminately than we ever saw uh, weapons used during the, the Cold War. But at the same time, uh, we're going to need the same sets of tools uh, that we built up during the Cold War in order to tackle this problem. That sort of ultimately this is a, a, a challenge that we have to face uh, with, you know, multilateral alliances and, and sort of international uh, groups working together to establish sets of norms and values, much like we used uh, the Cold War, um, dur or during the Cold War, we used issues like democracy and freedom of speech, freedom of religion as sort of rallying cries for the, uh, the effort that we were trying to build. Uh, this is also going to be um, an immensely complex undertaking, and sort of one of the things that we talk about in the book is that uh, the, the challenge that we face as a society in the way that over the last 25 to 35 years, we have taken everything that we value in our life that exists on paper and digitized it. And we have done it in, uh, uh, and, and digitized it in an in, in inherently insecure medium. Uh, and, and that is not a bug of the internet. That was originally the feature of the internet, was that the internet existed and was developed and the pro underlying protocols were developed uh, among research universities, among groups where everyone knew everyone else by name who was on the internet. And so they, it wasn't that they weren't thinking about security when they built this, they thought about security and made a very conscious decision that they didn't need it. They, that they, that, and you can sort of find these amazing quotes from people who uh, helped to design these systems, uh, literally saying, we just assumed we were going to be able to keep bad people off the internet because we would know who they were. <laughs> um, and they sort of never imagined that the tools that they were building as a way to share information among universities uh, would ultimately become the underpinning of all of global commerce. And that uh, not just that, but we we're sort of moving into this new era where we are about to re re remake all of the same mistakes that we have made with our information over the last quarter century, over the next decade with all of our stuff. And that uh, the rise of this so-called internet of things where your computer, uh, where your car becomes a computer, where your toaster becomes a computer, where your refrigerator becomes a computer, where your pacemaker becomes a computer, is fundamentally uh, all moving into a world where all of that is just as insecure as the, the internet has proven to be over the last quarter century. And that we've sort of gotten really, really used to you know, getting new credit cards in the mail on a regular basis when such and such retailer gets hacked or your health insurance records get stolen or any of that type of stuff. And it's sort of one thing when 
uh, your desktop computer is getting hit with ransomware and freezing up and you can't get to your family photos anymore. It's something else entirely when you're talking about, uh, you know, people's medical devices uh, being uh, hit with ransomware or uh, when you're talking about cars driving down the road at speed on the interstate uh, being able to be hijacked um, by uh, by hackers, which has already happened. This is, uh, you know, this is, none of this is actually uh, sort of fundamentally science fiction. This is um, hackers have, in a controlled experiment, demonstrated their ability to get in through, uh, get into a Jeep uh, Cherokee through uh, the air conditioning system and access, uh, while it's driving at speed on the interstate, uh, the braking system, and they were able to shut off the engine entirely and drive the car into a ditch. Uh, and ultimately, Jeep recalled 1.2 million uh, Jeeps uh, to fix that little bug. But that's sort of the type of thing that we are going to experience on a more regular basis. Um, we use the analogy in the book that we have sort of realized we are living in a house of straw and we are watching the wolf approach and we are madly trying to stuff more stuff into the house of straw rather than actively trying to get into a more secure house, uh, which uh, does not end well for the pig living in the straw house. Um, and that this uh, book sort of walks through how we have sort of at every turn systematically underestimated the way that bad actors were going to use the internet against us. Um, and that sort of at every turn of, uh, 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 of the last decade, despite all of the energy we've put into cybersecurity, all of the effort that the government has put into so-called critical infrastructure, we have at every turn uh, misguessed, misestimated uh, where the uh, uh, where foreign nation states would attack us. That sort of we spend so much time worrying about the power grid, worrying about water supplies, worrying about hospitals. The first place that Iran hit us. Uh, was a casino. Uh, they, uh, Iran uh, hacked and attacked uh, Sheldon Adelson's uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania casino uh, when Sheldon Adelson made some, uh, Iran thought, insulting remarks about uh, how Israel should turn Iran into a, a radioactive mushroom cloud. <laughs> And Iran retaliated uh, with um, bricking uh, the entire cas uh, Bethlehem casino, um, which, you know, we sort of look at that as an attack on physical infrastructure, but it's ultimately an attack on free speech. It's a, it's a foreign country coming into the United States and saying, uh, you can't say the things that you uh, get to say as an American without us hitting you in America. Similarly, uh, we have spent an inordinate amount of time thinking about what a rogue nuclear armed nation's uh, attack on the United States would look like. The government has done extensive war games thinking about how to respond to a North Korean attack. And it had never guessed that the first place that uh, North Korea would attack the United States was going after Sony Pictures Entertainment. And that, uh, uh, again, you have uh, a, a, an attack aimed at uh, attacking American values. Sort of, you know, artists and creative people in the United States can't make the art that they want to make uh, without being threatened by foreign powers uh, who sort of ultimately, remember North Korea was able to keep that absolutely terrible uh, Joe, uh, Josh Rogan movie from being shown in movie theaters, um, which is sort of, a, a, um, which if you have seen it, 
is a gift to uh, everyone who didn't get to see it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we don't want uh, American art being driven by sort of what foreign dictators think can and should be released inside the United States. We've spent an incredible amount of time uh, sort of uh, safeguarding the nation's uh, military and intelligence secrets from China. What we didn't anticipate was that China was going to steal all of the federal government's personnel records uh, in hacking into the Office of Personnel Management uh, and uh, be able to learn sort of not just the most intimate details of all of the federal employees' uh, backgrounds, uh, their families, their um, uh uh, their SF-86, which is the, the form that you fill out in order to get a, a security clearance that forces you to list basically every intimate thing that has ever happened in your life that could be potential for blackmail, that China now possesses uh, of sort of every government employee. Also, uh, China now, um, because actual CIA employees don't go through the regular federal uh, OPM record process, uh, they now know any diplomat who shows up at any embassy anywhere in the world whose personnel records China doesn't have is now a CIA officer. Um, and they have been able to uh, sort of with this reverse negative relief uh, resource that they created by stealing the personnel records, been able to compromise an entire generation of American intelligence personnel. And then, of course, Russia, we have spent so much time worrying about the power grid, worrying about uh, access to water systems. And the thing that we were not looking for was Russia attacking America's confidence in America. We, we sort of weren't looking, we weren't thinking uh, about the Russia's, uh, the, the way that Russia came after the 2016 election. Um, and we talk about in the book sort of how much of this really hinges on Sony Pictures Entertainment, which uh, America learned, uh, American watched the Sony Pictures hack go down. We read Amy Pascal's leaked emails, sort of all of the terrible things she had said about all of the other movie stars. And the lesson America learned from Sony Pictures was you need better passwords, you need sort of better drive segmentation to ensure that a hacker who gets into your system can't move you know, from this system to that system, uh, you know, better security for intellectual property, blah, 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 blah. Russia came away from the Sony Pictures uh, hack with a very different lesson. Russia looked at that and said, oh, the US media will just publish stolen emails if you steal the emails and give them to the media. And so not that long after the Sony Pictures hack, you begin to see Russia start rooting around looking for emails that they can steal from the DNC, from John Podesta, uh, from the DCCC, and are sort of able to launch this incredible attack on, uh, uh, on the, the 2016 election. Um, again, that we were sort of largely unprepared for, that we were, we had been focused on critical infrastructure in, you know, 16 different sectors as defined by the Department of Homeland Security, none of which were the election system, um, which sort of led the U.S. Um, uh, uh, DHS and the intelligence community to sort of rush to begin to try to figure out how do you secure the uh, election system with like 75 days notice in the summer of 2015, uh, the summer of 2016. And that uh, sort of the, the challenge and sort of the fear when you sort of go through these attacks and look at them is, you know, where, ha where is our imagination going to fail next? Um, it, you know, if, if we sort of look at this and we look at the most devastating attacks 
uh, that the country has faced, they are almost entirely the things that we don't imagine. Um, and uh, they come from incredibly unlikely places. I talk about in the final chapter a story that I've spent a lot of time reporting over the last two years, which if you remember the, the fall uh, 2016, actually almost exactly uh, two years ago, um, uh, there was a Friday afternoon on the East Coast where the internet sort of ground to a halt. The, the, it was an attack by uh, what was known at the time as the Mirai botnet. And what this was, was a, uh, a, a sort of a, 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 an internet weapon of mass destruction. And it was a, uh, a, a network of hijacked internet of things, devices, home thermostats, security cameras, wireless routers, sort of all of those things that you plug into your house and you sort of never think of again. Uh, turns out the security on them is terrible. Uh, and uh, they're sort of mostly made in China by lowest, you know, lowest common price manufacturers with very little security thought got, went into them. And so they had been harnessed together in this network to uh, do what was called a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack. And uh, so they were all sort of trying to access the same web pages at the same time and drowning these targeted websites in traffic. And what was, uh, uh, what was happening to us sort of in public that we saw, which is why the internet um, ground to a halt for everyone on that Friday in October, which we thought was the beginning of a massive cyber attack uh, against the election, not realizing that we were actually already living through a cyber attack on the election at the time, was that they had hit uh, one of the main sort of phone books on the internet. And so, uh, you know, your computer couldn't tell where Netflix was or where CNN.com was because the phone book was down. And so, it had been, uh, this Mirai botnet had been uh, sort of knocked off the internet offline for most of the East Coast. Uh, and, and what we now understand is that it was a weapon uh, built by and created by three college age students uh, who were trying to attack rivals in the video game Minecraft. And that they had built a tool more powerful than any tool that anyone had ever built on the internet before uh, without really meaning to. Uh, and that it was just sort of a much more effective botnet uh, than they had meant to launch. And it, uh, it, it actually sort of over uh, the course of the fall of 2016 uh, grew to the point where it knocked um, the entire country of Liberia offline. Uh, for a, a weekend um, when it was sort of turned against Liberia for complicated uh, reasons. And ultimately, these three kids uh, were caught by the FBI. One of them was a Rutgers student. One lived in New Orleans. One lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, they'd never met in person, sort of never meant to build this thing uh, and uh, caught by the FBI, uh, pleaded guilty, um, and about a month ago in a courtroom in Alaska, uh, were sentenced to, uh, creatively, five years of working for the FBI um, in order to, uh, because the uh, FBI basically realized that these kids were smarter than anyone that they actually had working on their cyber team. And so they were sentenced to five years of community service uh, with community service defined as service to the FBI. Um, and uh, you know, this, was, this is a, a tool, the Mirai botnet, uh, that was literally more powerful than anything a nation state possessed in its arsenal a decade ago. You know, if you were the most powerful nation in the world 10 years ago, you could not have built a tool as powerful as uh, um, these three kids sort of built accidentally 
uh, and then deployed against uh, their rivals in the video game Minecraft. And that that's sort of more like what we're going to see going forward than what we have seen in the past. Um, and so the book is sort of a, an attempt to try to explain uh, through walking through these cases um, how, how these unfold. Um, and then sort of part of this is also, you know, really looking at uh, how, how we should think about this, that there, there was sort of this very interesting and important turning point in the 1990s between the US and Russia, where this problem was emerging and the US defined it as cyber operations. And so we have grown up in ability that's very technical, that's sort of focused on network exploitation, uh, that is focused on sort of getting into other people's systems, defending our own systems. Russia defined it not as cyber, but as information operations. And that that uh, has meant that they have sort of looked at it much more holistically than we ever did. Uh, and that they came at the 2016 election sort of with this different mindset, not just thinking about how, how do you do the bits and bytes, but how do you deploy the information through the bits and bytes in order to influence and achieve your strategic goals. Um, the last uh, chapter of the book, uh, it, we look at sort of this problem of fake news, um, which uh, uh, we mean in sort of the, the, the strictest definition, not the presidential uh, definition of sort of anything that he doesn't happen to like at that particular moment, <laughs> but fake news as a weapon and sort of the challenge of uh, what Russia did in the 2016 election. Um, and, and actually, again, sort of how many parallels there are to what ISIS did um, and what a group call, uh, called the Syrian Electronic Army did, um, which is one of the cases that we talk about um, in, in the book, sort of this incredible, uh, fascinating case that sort of shows how complicated uh, and global these challenges are, where uh, a um, hacker from the Balkans living in Singapore broke into a US retailer uh, and then uh, stole credit card data, stole user data, sold it uh, to the Syrian Electronic Army, uh, which is sort of a, a digital terror group associated with uh, Bashar al-Assad's uh, Syrian uh, um, uh, army, and they weaponized it, turned it into a kill list of US servicemen that they then sent out over Twitter back to sort of radicalized supporters in the US saying, here are the names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses of US servicemen and women, uh, go kill them. And uh, it, it ultimately didn't translate into um, uh, any servicemen being, a serviceman or women being killed in the United States, but it certainly could have. Uh, and that this is sort of the, the types of challenges that the government is beginning to try to wrap its arms around uh, in, in this world. Um, I might sort of stop there and take questions because I've covered sort of an incredible amount of ground and can sort of dive into any bit of this um, in uh, more detail. So, yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. You're right, that's an awful lot to digest. So my question is, actually, I'll do it in two parts. One. Are we, are we, as we meaning this country, actually trying to think more creatively about, about this threat now? And secondly, we all go home tonight terrified and, and go yeah. back to our jobs tomorrow. Um, is there anything that we can do to 
help either protect ourselves or you know help direct things in a better direction? Yeah. Um, so both good questions, and and the first answer is. Uh, and they're sort of very much related in, in some ways. Um, the first answer is like, yes, sort of. Um, the government is getting sort of much better at this. And partly that's the strategy that the book lays out of taking public action against these, um, uh, uh, against foreign nation state hackers uh, who are coming after the US. Um, and this is uh, the, the book, sort of the reason that John um, asked me to sort of team up to write it um, was the goal, you know, his whole strategy in the Justice Department was transparency. The government needs to be better about talking publicly about these threats. Um, he still didn't think the government had done a very good job at that over the course of his time. So we wrote the book to try to help spread the message of what the government has actually done. Um, and, and it's sort of fascinating and remarkable in uh, when you begin to sort of look back over this. So the first uh, sort of place where the strategy comes together is the, um, the charging of five Chinese PLA hackers um, for targeting U.S. Steel and a number of other companies for economic espionage in the uh, in 2014, uh, they and the, these cases sort of uh, that was the first one and it was incredibly hard um, put together by this team, uh, this incredibly small team uh, inside the Justice Department, uh, and but it's become sort of a more regular uh, feature. Um, and um, the, the U.S. Uh, this year alone now has brought public charges against Iranian hackers, North Korean hackers, Russian hackers, and Chinese hackers. Um, and even though those cases, uh, for the most part, don't result in people showing up in U.S. courtrooms, uh, they, they actually do have a pretty powerful effect which is uh, it makes life really unpleasant to be under US indictment, uh, even if you are not currently in handcuffs from the US government. Um, and you can effectively not travel outside of your home country anymore. Um, you know, you can't travel uh, to, um, uh, you know, most Western countries, European countries, um, even most African countries or South American countries. Um, and sort of one of the things we talk about in the book is like hackers have girlfriends and girlfriends want to go on vacation. Um, and the government has had actually a tremendous six amount of success capturing hackers for foreign countries while they're on vacation. Um, and one of the cases that we talk about, which I would almost guarantee no one in this room has ever heard of, um, is a Burlington case where the US uh, captured an Iranian hacker who had broken into a Burlington defense contractor and stolen uh, their missile guidance uh, simulator, uh, taken it to, you know, taken it to Iran. Guy goes on vacation to Turkey. U.S. nabs him in Turkey. He spends 18 months in a Turkish prison uh, awaiting extradition um, and comes back to a Burlington courtroom here and pleads guilty uh, to cyber espionage, which uh, um, I would imagine none of you have heard of, which is sort of a testament to how poorly the government has done actually celebrating the rare successes <laughs> that it has had. Um, uh, but that was sort of for, at, at that moment, a real groundbreaking case. Um, and that what we have seen uh, in the years since is sort of similar actions applied to, to Russians. Um, the uh, US actually captured um, uh, some very high profile Russian figures um, it, uh, last year on vacation, one in the Maldives, one in, um, one in Spain, um, one of the most notorious spammers um, uh, in the history of the internet, who was at, at one point responsible for about a third of all of the spam that was sent in on online, um, was you know captured uh, on vacation with his 
family in uh, in in Spain last year brought to Connecticut, uh, and uh, I think just pleaded guilty or was found guilty at trial, um, and that this is sort of trying to become a much more routine thing. The um, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein on September 25th this year uh, uh, made public a set of changes to the U.S. Attorney's Manual that says that the U.S. government will now default to making charges of election meddling uh, public, um, which is actually a pretty significant change that this is now, uh, this is something that the government is going to make public and make public sort of as quickly as it can, um, which is, uh, I I interestingly, um, the, the criminal complaint that came down that was announced on Friday was actually signed on September 28th, so just three days after this action, which sort of leads to interesting speculation about why was that action taken on September 28th, and then why was it not released until last Friday? Um, and the answers could include such intriguing possibilities as the U.S. thought it would, had a chance to capture that woman um, somewhere uh, overseas um, between the 28th and last Friday, um, and perhaps did capture that woman somewhere between September 28th and last Friday. Um, and that while she's not in U.S. custody yet, that uh, the government has not said anything about whether she is in custody somewhere. Um, which is, uh, leads to some intriguing possibilities about um, uh, sort of that action there. Um, to the second half of the, the question, um, sort of what, what can we do about it? Um, I, I think that there are sort of two really important things to do about it. Um, one is this, uh, you know, we sort of talk about this or we sort of think about this problem often as sort of black magic, that this is like super cyber ninjas battling other cyber ninjas deep inside the inner tubes. And, you know, it's completely incomprehensible to us. And the uh, answer is almost all of this happens because people do incredibly dumb things like use the word password as your password. Um, and that this is sort of mostly an IT problem, not a security problem. And that if you do sort of an incredibly short list of things uh, that are pretty easy to do in your daily life, uh, you can both sort of avoid being targeted by cyber attacks in general, and then also make it much harder for everyone else doing bad stuff on the internet to do bad stuff on the internet. And that's sort of use strong passwords, use um, a, a password manager if you can, um, that sort of helps you organize and uh, use strong passwords. Um, use two-factor authentication sort of on anything that you can, um, which is you know on your Facebook or your, your Twitter um, or your email. Um, what, it, what it'll basically do is it'll make you It'll text your telephone. Uh, you know, you both have to enter your a number or enter your password, and then it'll text your telephone a special code uh, that you also enter, which makes sure that it's actually you, because only you theoretically also have your telephone um, at, at the same time as your password. And so, if uh, a Russian hacker is has stolen your password successfully, they still won't be able to get into your account because they don't also have access to your telephone. Um, and then the second thing is, um, uh, like, uh, vote for policymakers who are going to take these issues seriously. Um, and, and I don't actually mean that as a partisan um, comment, uh, because uh, it, it, it's not. It's when you look at the Mark Zuckerberg hearing um, on Capitol Hill uh, in March of this year, uh, it was not significantly more sophisticated than Ted Stevens talking in 2006 about the internet is not a dump truck, the internet is a series of tubes. And that there were sort of 
members of Congress, uh, you know, U.S. senators sitting in that hearing who didn't understand fundamentally what Facebook's business model is um, and, uh, and sort of didn't understand the advertising system and the data that went behind it. Um, and, and, you know, it, 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 we need people in these jobs who sort of understand these issues uh, in order to ensure that we're making smart policies about this um, and that this is um, it, it, in some it, it sort of whenever there has been new technology that has come into the fore, we have created new regulatory agencies to deal with it. Um, we did that with the railroads. We did that with sort of mass production food. We did that with uh, cars. We did that with planes. We did that with, you know, TV and radio. Um, and we sort of don't have any good system in place to regulate or to provide oversight for this incredibly massive and incredibly important uh, new world of technology. Yeah. yeah. I've heard you saying what everybody else is doing to us. Are we, are, is this country doing pretty much the same thing to everybody else? Uh, yes. Uh, um, and sorry, that, uh, I meant to answer that as part of uh, the, the other question, which is. Not to excuse it. Yeah, well, so, and this, this is sort of, uh, this gets into this really complicated and thorny policy question. I mean, none of what I'm talking about is, is sort of easy or straightforward. Um, and part of that is one of the reasons that we have been really loath to take aggressive action in this world is we're the most wired of all of the countries. You know, we are the most vulnerable uh, on every stage of this. Um, you know, the entire country of North Korea has fewer internet addresses than probably the downtown core of Montpelier does here. Um, so, you know, even if we were able, to, even if we had turned around Sony and, and hit and totally knocked North Korea offline, it wasn't going to matter that much. Um, but what we have done is uh, some interesting and, and actually really sort of important and effective work on uh, what you sort of loosely would call offensive cyber operations. And we were the first ones to do it. Um, we crossed the, the digital Rubicon first um, by attacking Iran's nuclear program um, with something called Stuxnet, um, which was, um, I'm sort of oversimplifying an incredibly complex uh, attack, but we, we sort of injected malware into the centrifuges in Iran's nuclear system that caused them to just act wacky. Um, and so they would tear themselves apart and destroy themselves on a semi-random basis. Um, and what was so effective about that was we undermined the Iranian scientists' confidence in themselves. And so they thought they were setting up the centrifuges wrong. So they would sort of take, you know, whole sets of centrifuges down offline to try to figure out what they had done wrong. And then they'd start them back up and, you know, three more of them would blow up. And they, um, and, and, and it was sort of a, a particularly insidious attack in, in a way that, you know, if we had actually just dropped a bomb on the facility and blown them up, they would have known that we'd blown it up and they would have been able to sort of start from scratch. And this really delayed the nuclear program for about two years, um, it, which sort of ultimately, I think, had a pretty important uh, uh, part in bringing them to the table for the Iranian nuclear deal. Um, and then um, the U.S. Cyber Command and the NSA launched this incredibly effective series of attacks on ISIS um, that, that really helped um, sort of 
break up ISIS's uh, command and control system on the ground in Iraq um, in, in a way that was really effective. And then actually just literally today, um, there was reporting in the New York Times that the U.S. has launched the first offensive cyber attacks against Russia um, and that we have begun uh, uh, basically telling Russians who are messing with our midterm elections that we know who they are and that they're messing with our elections. And so um, we don't know exactly what that looks like, but like it's, it's sort of as simple a concept as we're like emailing individual Russian intelligence officers and saying, hey, Vladimir, we noticed that you're trying to hack the election. Just want to let you know that we know you, Vladimir, live at you know such and such street in St. Petersburg, and we'd really encourage you to do something different with your life. Um, and that, again, that, that sort of actually can be very effective um, because, uh, you know, you don't really, as an intelligence officer, you don't really want to be on a foreign intelligence agency's radar. It sort of makes you pretty ineffective at the job that you're doing. And if, by the way, and this sort of again gets back to the question of sort of, uh, you know, you'll hear these indictments uh, denigrated as sort of naming and shaming, um, but the, you know, if you are an advanced, uh, you know, capable Russian hacker, um, you know, maybe you go work for a legit company rather than join the government. If you think working for the government is going to end up, you know, getting you on a no fly list to Western Europe, uh, or if you are, and I talk about one of these cases, uh, here, one of the most effective Russian cyber criminals. Um, we uh, we never caught him. We have no idea how much he actually stole from the U.S. It was this case called Game Over Zeus, um, and we uh, uh, we stopped counting when he successfully stole a hundred million dollars from U.S. banks. Um, we so it was somewhere north of a hundred million. We just don't know how far because we only bothered to count the first hundred million. Um, indicted him in 2014, um, and uh, he hasn't been seen on the internet since. Um, sort of no one will partner with him uh, to sort of launch another, uh, you know, cyber attack, cyber crime <laughs> scheme, because, you know, who wants to partner with the guy who's under indictment for the U.S. government already? But I, yeah. I was thinking more lines of with our third year history plus of uh, interfering with governments in South America and Central America. Um, it seems, are, are we doing the same thing on a cyber level now? N no, we're not. Um, and, 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 and part of the reason is we have sort of figured out that it actually wasn't that effective, that we sort of weren't that good in interfering in you know, South American, Central American elections in the, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and so we sort of gave it up as an intelligence uh, enterprise. It's so effective against us, though. Uh, yes, it, it, it turned out to be, uh, unfortunately, quite successful against us. Yeah. Yeah, hi. I, I wrote the bill prohibiting electronic voting in Vermont, and I've been mm -hmm. following who stole what from whom over the years, and the interesting situation with the DNC stealing the votes from Sanders when he apparently would have would have won, uh, taking it, you know, jump, jumping up to that, that made everybody who denied, including Obama and all the way down, everybody denied, oh, that that can't happen, it can't happen, it can't happen. And then suddenly, and this is what I think is extremely funny, oh, but the Russians can do it, Sequoia can't do it, Debo can't do it, the states can't do it, nobody can do it, oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, but Russia can. So can you explain that uh, hypocrisy in all that, and why isn't anybody prosecuting the DNC for stealing? I know Sanders doesn't want to have anything to do with it, but why isn't there a story in, about, about the DNC stealing from Sanders, and what's this sudden, oh, Russia can do it if nobody else can? Yeah, and I think that sort of one of the weaknesses that the uh, sort of 2016 attack showed from Russia was 
the you know the challenge in our election system is it only works if we have confidence in it um and you know we sort of only believe the results because we sort of think we should believe the results and what makes and this this was sort of what i was talking about in the fall of 2016 is like the the worst case scenario um for an election attack was you wouldn't even have to prove that you'd actually changed a vote all you would have to do is sort of you know show a screenshot of being inside the Broward County uh, you know clerk's office voting database and if they just released that in uh, on election day um you know there are um it, you know that would be devastating to the, the sort of american confidence in the system and, and i think that that's where um that's where people are most worried about where this is going is sort of the next stage of these cyber attacks that we haven't seen yet is a data manipulation attack um, where um, uh, you know you go into uh, a bank's system and you know announce I've changed one percent of all of the accounts, um, or I've sort of randomly reassigned uh, you know people's savings accounts, uh, you know, across the whole database, um, you know, or, you know, you go into a hospital and uh, tell them that you've changed all of the blood pressures for all of the patients. Um, and that, you know, so much of our digital life now exists sort of inside these databases that uh, we don't have, I'm oversimplifying this obviously because there are, you know, backups and tape backups and, um, you know, sort of that type of thing, but there's sort of no, no real reason to believe that they work uh, except that we're told that they work. Um, and, uh, you know, you could sort of s s imagine any number of nightmare scenarios where, um, it, you know, you, you sort of attack the confidence in the American economy um, or, you know, go after the stock market or, or something that could have huge widespread attacks. Um, uh, one of the, the, the uh, the the actual no one no one knows this but uh, the most devastating financial uh, cyber attack ever in terms of damages caused was a uh, Syrian electronic army hacker who hacked the AP's Twitter handle and sent out a tweet saying uh explosions at the white house president obama injured um and it caused in just seconds uh something like a 1.2 billion dollar drop in the stock market um and it was correct the whole thing was sort of corrected and shown to be false in something under like three minutes i mean it was just a snap uh the but you know you wouldn't have to sort of imagine too much from that uh, to sort of see how the next stage of these attacks could play out. Um, and, and, you know, we're not through the midterm elections yet. You know, there's sort of uh, plenty of reason to believe that there is the possibility that we'll see something like that unfold in the next two weeks. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you'd comment on the New York Times Magazine article on cyber insecurity of the polling system. Yeah. Um, it, and, and the sort of, the, the good news, bad news uh, is like America's voting system is so broken, it would be really hard to hack at scale. Um, which is not to say it could not, 
you know, parts of it could not be targeted quite successfully. Um, there are, um, I think it's five states that don't require paper backups. Um, John was actually one of the lawyers um, pressing in, in the Georgia case to force Georgia to use paper backups, um, and they did not get that. So Georgia is moving forward without paper backups, um, and it's an all digital system, which is sort of a recipe for disaster. Um, and uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, again, this is sort of one of the corners of critical infrastructure that we've just thought very poorly about. I mean, we've sort of poured an incredible amount of, uh, resources into things like the, uh, the electrical grid. Um, but, you know, it, it, when you, Yeah. And yet when the, there is the legislation, I think it's HAVA, yep. uh, and attempts to include security in that have been fought. It, they, it, it, and they've been fought, um, it, it, you know, sort of, the, this is sort of part of the general problem of a lot of the cyber threats, um, uh, and most particularly you see it in the elections, which is... Uh, you know, this is a system that is overseen in 110,000 different precincts, um, you know, with different technologies, with incredibly different varying levels of technological skill and know-how. Um, and, you know, it, in many ways, the like Vermont, you know, town clerks with their binders of paper voter data is actually turns out to be like the most secure best system for the 21st century um it, but like that this has been um you know w the federal government sort of tried to step in in 2016 on an emergency basis and uh we talk about sort of one pretty spectacular scene uh it, where Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan um, sort of shot down the attempts to make this a bipartisan effort in 2016. Um, and, but then sort of there was this whole secondary thing where governors and secretaries of state saw DHS, you know, arriving to help as the federal government sort of arriving to, to take over state elections. <laughs> Um, and, you know, sort of undermining the very sort of federalism that underpins the American system. And that this is, um, it, it, you know, I think sort of one of, one of the things that leaves me sort of really worried about the next phase of this, um, sort of everything, not just the election, but everything, um, is the government's efforts writ large in this space are short by, I, I think, sort of multiple orders of magnitude. Um, so DHS uh, is the agency on the civilian side that is sort of the lead for cyber incident response. It doesn't do the investigation, which is what the Secret Service does and the FBI does. Secret Service handles sort of non-nation state cyber stuff. FBI handles nation state cyber stuff. I'm oversimplifying broadly and generally. Um, but the, um, uh, the DHS right this fall is trying to sort of finally rename the part of DHS that does civilian cyber incident response from what has been for history called NPPD, the National Programs and Protection Division. Uh, I don't even think I have that right, and I'm probably one of the only people who actually knows what it would have stood for at all. Um, but they're renaming NPPD CISA, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. So that you will at least now know that that's the part of DHS that's supposed to do cybersecurity. Uh, once they end up transferring out all of the parts of NPPD that don't do cybersecurity and leave just the part that does cybersecurity, there will be 1,200 people at DHS doing cybersecurity. 
which means that there are fewer people doing security, doing cybersecurity for DHS uh, nationally for the entire US economy and government than JP Morgan Chase employs to do cybersecurity just for JP Morgan Chase. Um, and so like, no wonder the government is not in a position to be doing what it needs to be doing for voting systems, for electrical systems, for uh, healthcare. Um, we just don't have enough people doing it. And you sort of look at the infrastructure that we built after 9-11 uh, for counterterrorism, you know, the brand new agencies, tens of thousands of people, you know, every single airport screener in the entire country, now a federal government employee uh, under an all new agency. Um, and we have yet to have sort of any similar shift in resources to combat cybersecurity. Yeah. You talk about the asymmetrical nature of all of this. And I think of, you know, Russia, Europe, NATO, and the EU, and how that's always been a problem for them, that they're getting bigger, more united, and stronger. And it's just incredible how cheap it is yeah. for them to go and start to break that up. And I wanted to ask if you see, or not you, but has there been ev any evidence of their having meddled in the Brexit vote? Um, yes. Uh, I think there there has been evidence, uh, sort of how thoroughly, how successfully is is a separate question. Um, I, I've seen pretty conflicting reports about sort of whether it had any measurable impact. Um, and and this is you know sort of two two quick points in, in this. One is, um, you know, this is the reason to do this is it's super cheap. Um, the, uh, um, you know, all of the internet research agency, uh, has dedicated, um, you know, the number was in the Friday indictment, something like $30 million to attacking, you know, U.S. information influence operations over the last three years. Um, you know, something like a million dollars a month, um, if you look at what Vladimir Putin has gotten out of helping Donald Trump win the presidency, um, you know, a million dollars a month is like literally nothing um, in the scheme of sort of superpower politics. Um, it, and, it, and then I think sort of part of where this really gets complicated is, and you saw this again in, in the Friday indictment, and you saw this, you saw the president say this the other day, um, and you sort of see this gets into the Brexit question too, is, you know, the language that keeps coming up in these indictments is there's no evidence that votes were altered, which is a very, very different thing than saying that votes weren't influenced. And that it, I think it's sort of impossible to look at <coughs> Brexit or the US election in 2016 and not look at the environment that was created uh, and sort of inflamed by Russia's efforts um, and not think that in an election decided by 86,000 votes across six states uh, that that wasn't probably determinative, um, that, uh, that there was not sort of sufficient noise injected into the system that drove, you know, everything from James Comey's decision to hold a press conference in the first place to his decision to, uh, you know, announce the, um, you know, the, the Anthony Weiner laptop at the end, um, that that wasn't sort of actually very much driven by Russian noise and sort of people sort of um, skip over the sort of one of the things that Comey has even said is that his decision was actually his decision to hold that July press conference was actually very directly influenced by Russian misinformation that he knew was Russian misinformation, which was there was this rumor 
that Russia was circulating online uh, that Loretta Lynch had been compromised um, by the Clintons that he knew was floating around in intelligence circles and he knew was fake, but he feared if it came out, it would undermine any confidence in Loretta Lynch making the ultimate decision in the Clinton emails. And so he has sort of framed his decision to step out and do that press conference as sort of the way to ensure that Russia didn't undermine our confidence in Loretta Lynch, um, which is sort of a really stunning and very, very weird set of circumstances to imagine, again, you know, you don't have to get down to, uh, you know, Russia actually hacking Wisconsin uh, voting systems to sort of see how those things ricocheted all the way through the 2016 election. I think maybe one more question. I don't want to go all night here. Okay. So, yeah. Do you think paper ballots is like the way to solve that problem as far as Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or a paper backups, effectively. That, you know, you need... Well, so... There are sort of multiple levels of things. I mean, one is, you know, you need a paper backup. Two, you need sort of uh, effectively, like, across the board digital audits um, to make sure that... You know the yeah. votes right. are, are actually the votes recorded are actually similar to the votes that were actually cast, um, and, and we don't do a lot of that. Um, and, and in particular, we sort of only do that in places where there's sort of it, it's actually super close. So like, if you hack a landslide, like we're never going to notice that. Like we're only going to really try to catch it if you like you know you hack a five vote margin. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming out. Um, good luck getting through the next two weeks. <laughs>